Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another PPP brought to you by Shea Station. Talking about all the Mets players on the 2022 roster. And today, we got another outfielder to talk about. Another new face to the franchise. Another former athletic. <laughs> they, I mean, they just keep coming. Man. <laughs> They're Marte, piling up. Bassett, and now? Mark Canna. Excited about this one. I am too. I'm excited for Mets fans to see this guy's set of sideburns. <laughs> We're talking super clean, 1996 Joe Maurer mm. with more flair. They've got a little bit more forward push, yeah, a little bit more Elvisy style. Um, brave to do it, I love it. The art of the sideburn has really waned. In yes, recent years. you know, people are afraid to pull it off now. Ken is not afraid of anything. I think I think Matt's telling of his understand. character. Yes, yeah. he's also uh, a foodie, which moving from the Bay Area. Great food town, great food area yeah. to New York. I mean, plenty of great food there, too. If there was a team in Paris, we might have a competition. A little bit. Uh, but there's not. And so New York is the place. And he, I know for a fact that he is super excited uh, to play baseball for many reasons. Uh, one of the top ones being the food, access to all the amazing restaurants. Do you think he'll be a New York pizza guy? I think he'll be a New York everything guy. Mm. He's a, he's a, Get into the culture, feel it out, get granular with it, yeah, and uh, come out on the other end. So, I'm excited for this just because when we did our lineup predictions way back earlier in the offseason, uh, Canna was in my lineup. He was a guy that I thought the Mets should uh, keep their eye on. Big on base guy, lot to like about Canna, and also a cheaper price tag than some of these other premier outfielders while still getting some pretty good production. So I was very happy. Uh, when the Mets grabbed him on a two-year I deal. I forgot you put him in your, your ideal lineup. It's the only one that hit, but I was very happy well, when it did. You know, I bet uh, Alonso was in that lineup, yeah, too. I mean, he, sh he should be in ours. And Lindor. You know, those, Lindor those are too. obvious ones. He should get those. Gotcha. For sure. So let's talk a little bit about what he did last year, huh? Yeah. I, I'd love to talk about his, his year because he had... A very good one. Yeah. A very interesting one. That's it. It's different. It's not... We just talked about Marte, and he was a little bit different because he produced power numbers um, without the huge home run total. Right. What did what did Canna do different? So Canna, it's very interesting because his slugging percentage from last year was 387. That does fall below a decent bit on his career average of 431. The thing is, Canna got hit more than any other hitter in baseball last season, 27 times. And that just helped balloon his on-base percentage way above his batting average. So that really balanced out the OPS number in the end. But Canna is very similar to Nimmo, in my mind, with these on-base numbers. He also walked a ton. Yeah. So he, he's always been known for his kind of plate discipline. Um, he doesn't chase. And now he's added, like, another element. He's coming into his age 33 season, another little bit older guy. But what was his deal? We only got him for two years. Two years. Two years, 24. And what a steal. That feels like a steal to me. Two years, um, 26.5. He just fits the mold of our lineup uh, like really well. Right. His like philosophy to hitting, the way he's super patient, doesn't try to do too much. It's it's well balanced. I yeah, he's 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 a good fit. I'm excited to have him on the team. We talked a lot about like trying to get more power into the lower half of the Mets lineup and Canna from the look of things right now, a 111 OPS plus really carried by that on-base percentage. It makes you think that he would logically fall into the top of the lineup more so than the bottom. But the thing is, a guy like Canna stretches out your lineup and adds that on-base number to the middle where really it's been only at the top for the Mets in recent seasons. So I feel like it expands the lineup a little bit. It's a matter of where do you put him, really. I feel like he kind of feels like a six or a seven hitter to me. Yeah, he's not really a home run hitting guy. In yeah. 2019, he had like a, a supreme year, like his best offensive year. Uh, he hit 26 homers. Uh, he also slugged 517, which he, last year he did 387 and still had a really good year. So I expect somewhere in the middle. I expect him to be, you know, a 15 kind of home run guy. And that would slide him towards like the eight nine hole for me like I want him to be on base in front of the other guys you know seven eight would be a prime spot but this is these are the problems that you have when you have such depth you're able to push a quality bat like Mark Canna all the way down in the back half to where you can take advantage of it because he's not a power guy we have guys that do better things on base that at, at a higher clip let you do your thing at the back end if you get 
a quality at bat like he gives in the eight spot or the nine spot, that completely changes your lineup because there's no time off for that starting pitcher to kind of breeze through, and he's always going to be racking up those those pitch totals. Yeah, and I mean a big. I feel like a big thing that the Mets struggled with last season is just the top heaviness of their lineup and like not spreading around the town enough, just because it was kind of needed at the top. Like you need to get rallies started in that way. With Canna, he could. I feel like he could easily be like a two hitter or a three hitter on a, maybe a lesser team. But uh, with the Mets lineup right now, I mean, I still think that we do need a little bit more pop in the middle. And we both obviously know who we, we want. want a left handed hitter. We want a left handed power bat. Left handed power bat. Yeah. And Canna doesn't have to be the right handed power bat by any means. He can just supplement the lineup. And like you said, like get to the tail end of the lineup. You want rallies to start even before you hit your Nimmo and your Marte. And Canna could be the perfect candidate uh, to start those kinds of rallies. I like everything you said. I think I think Canna is kind of he has this style of at bat, a style, the approach at the plate that he can kind of adapt to whatever the team needs. If they need him to try to use that power and, and go deep, he can do that. He can reach back and sacrifice the things that he's trying to do. He's a team player. This guy wants to win. Um, I keep seeing the same things, but I am excited to have him. Do you think that he is our right fielder or left fielder next season? I he's played both. I, I, I don't think it is up to him. I think it's up to Brandon Nimmo. Wherever Brandon Nimmo seems to be the most comfortable is the opposite is where Mark Canna is going to go. Right, right. And he's he's capable of playing. I think he played more left last year. Every highlight I saw of his was always from left field. Um, but I, he's versatile enough to be able to, to man it. Yeah, and I feel like you, you are going to be missing the cannon in right field for Michael Conforto and like what Cannon brings to this team. Conforto brought many different things that, you know, you can't really liken the two even though Cannon is, I guess, his replacement in a way. Yeah, I don't, there, I don't even see him as the same job, to right, be honest. Exactly. They just end up playing the same position. And like, that's okay because I, I think the Mets are filling the void of Conforto in other areas, and there's still the possibility Conforto could come back. I just I personally don't see it that way. Mm-hmm. If the Mets decide to bring in a fourth outfielder, and we talked a little bit about Marte getting rest days and Nimmo possibly getting rest days because of injury history, I think that helps Canna too, honestly, because Canna I, I see bouncing between right and left just when the Mets need him to be in a certain space. Um, so I think he could also benefit from that, but I, I just really like it because all three of our outfield guys are just big on base number guys. I feel like they're all table setters. And if one of those guys is struggling or needs to be moved back, Canna can fill that role or they need a day off. He can, he's a one or two hitter. Yeah. He's a, he's that good. And so you can fill him in there. Yeah, and like we, you talked about his 2019 season before. That kind of ballooned a lot of his stats. 26 homers was a career high. He had never passed 20 in any other season. Canna, I want Mets fans to know, I feel like is not going to be the big pop guy. And, like, that's perfectly Correct. fine. I think he might give you 15 home runs. I want Canna to try and hit for more doubles. I, I, we talked a little bit about this on a previous PPP. But uh, that slugging percentage could easily soar if he's hitting that 20 double mark, that benchmark there. Because without it, you know, the, his OPS is still a solid number, but I feel like you're not getting enough extra bases from Canna, and that's really what could take the next step for him. That could really enhance the deal that the Mets gave him. I like I like his approach now. I wouldn't want him to change too too much, but I do want him to focus on getting on base. Yeah, I, doubles. You don't have to try to hit home runs. I think the power will play naturally. So, what do you want to do? Let's get into the steamer projections. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about what we're expecting from Canna next season. And, and by what, we, we mean fan graphs. Fan graphs, but also I I put a lot of stock in this as well, and I yep. feel like a lot of the times they've been pretty solid in these predictions. But at the same time, a lot of it is just eh, he's probably going to repeat his career numbers to an extent. They have him hitting uh, 18 home runs here, I believe. Which I mean, it's not too far out of his average. Exactly, 17 last year. So, yeah. but I I do think about you know how City Field will play. Like if that's because he did play I in mean, the Coliseum. I was going to say years. he played in the Coliseum, so, so he's probably used to it at this point. Correct. Exactly. So that's a big ballpark for you guys that don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's never played American there. American League, you know? man, I know. Well, actually, I mean, we might play there once a year now, or once every other year with the new rules. Yeah, so that's pretty interesting. That's a pod for another day. Ah. We haven't really talked about that much. But uh, they have him slugging over 400, which would be an improvement over last season as well, uh, putting up a similar wins above replacement. So his defensive value is probably pretty static at this point. He's another plus defender, in my opinion. Probably not a guy that you would ever see patrolling center, but still. Is he a plus defender? I In a corner outfield position, I'd say so. Yeah, I, I 
again, I don't know the metrics. Yeah. Like he, his numbers say that he's a plus defender. I mainly uh, look at uh, the range factor, and then I also look at the uh, jump that you get on a ball. And those are two n- stats that Ken has excelled in, or at least been above average in, in the past three years. Okay, great. So now I'm excited. Yeah, not again, not quite a Conforto in that way because I don't think he's known, or at least in my own head assessment, I don't think he's known for being a plus defender. And I don't expect him to be a plus defender. I expect him to make the plays that he's supposed to make and not make any mistakes and hit your cutoff, man. Just do it simple. But when you think of Mets, you know, left fielders of the past, I definitely think Canna is an improvement because we've seen some characters just thrown into corner outfield positions in the blue and orange, you know? And, like, it's not the fault of those guys. A lot of those guys were first base. Like, Dom Smith is a perfect example. Not a left fielder by trade. Did the best that he could uh, do and actually improved in the amount of time that he played left field. But Mark Canna is a natural outfielder, always has been. That's sort of been his position for his entire career. So that's that's what gives me confidence there, well, I feel like. All right. You know? We'll see it. I hope I love so. it. So I have him just sort of splitting time between left and right. As for where he'd bat in the lineup, we talked a little bit about that before. I think... A little bit higher than that eight range that you gave him, I think a six or seven there. But again, a left-handed power bat changes the entire thing. Yeah, I guess I'm just assuming that we get Kyle Schwarber, which is a terrible thing to do because we've made such positive moves in a lot of different places. Um, But I I think that he is a seven-eight hitter in our lineup, and that's his amazing thing to say. Well, that's like when you take a kid to the candy store and you give him, you know, a cookie, a lollipop, a sucker, whatever. You give him everything, he's going to want more. And, like, that's how I feel a little bit yeah, right I'm being, now. I am being a bratty kid. <laughs> Not bratty, but, like, demanding, you know? But it's because you want the best. We'll talk about this off the air. I don't feel good about it. You don't agree? No, I'm not a bratty kid. I feel like a bratty kid oh, sometimes. That's Mets, fine. Mets fans get that rep in general. Yeah. Don't you think? It's because it's New York. I'm going to refrain. What's up, Moylan? <laughs> Uh, so Stand what else down. do you want to get into? So I, you see their slugging percentage here. Yeah. 415. That is a little high, I think. It's think not. It's I, I think it's a little high. I think it's a little bit high just for the simple fact that it was so low last year. Yeah. Like, like out of the ordinary low. Right. And that's actually a little bit of my over-under. Yeah. Bit, not to spoil anything. But I'm interested to see where you think he'll land. Do you think it's more in that 390, 387 range that he had last year? I think it's like right around 400, 4 to 405. I would, think it's, would you as a Mets fan be satisfied with that from Canna? Yeah. I mean, if you get, you just signed him to a deal. If he gives you something similar to the year he just had uh, and a touch higher, I think you he improved. I think you you have to be satisfied with that. Yeah. Um, as a Met, as the Mets front office, I don't think they would be mm-hmm. because they're they're projecting him to do better things than that. But I just don't. I don't see. I don't know. I don't see him crushing the ball. So I see him getting, you know, on base at a little bit higher. And I feel like that's like the pressure of these three new Mets that are coming in that we constantly group together in Marte, yeah. Cannon, and Escobar. They're all expected to not only play better than, you know, their career highs to that point or whatever career averages, but also just change the dynamic of the Mets lineup that sorely needed change last year and didn't have these spark plugs, uh, spark plugs coming in. This is, this is one of those projections of where I feel, but I'm also completely, I, would, I wouldn't be out of the realm of possibilities that he just goes off yeah. because he's going to be protected. The A's had a great lineup when he was playing there, but he's going to be protected in that lineup with, with what's coming behind him that he's going to get some pitches to hit. So um, he could go off and yeah. get close to his career best. But I just think his style of play is is more tame now. And I, I definitely agree that some of those A's lineups were definitely good. Like he had a prime Matt Chapman in there. Matt Olson had some great seasons as well. But the Mets are trying to build a very balanced lineup. And I still think it's missing a piece or maybe even two pieces. But Mark Canna is definitely going to be looked at as, you know, a core piece of that lineup, probably playing most days. I don't know if the Mets are going to work in that fourth outfielder for him as much as Marte and Nimmo. So he's going to be looked at as sort of an everyday guy. And I mean, I look at the games played here. 141 from last season is really encouraging. We talked about Marte sort of at that 120 benchmark. Canna is usually around there, but 2021 was a step up for him from last year a big year for him his contract year that's probably what helped him parlay a pretty good deal with the Mets here so I'm hoping that if nothing else he maintains the production from last year but also just stays on the field and stays reliable in a corner outfield position yeah like last year was his first full season playing since 
you know, 2018. Yeah, pretty so, much. Or 2019, he had 120, 122 games, 126. Yeah. That was a big step up, 141. And manning right field, you, you might be asked to do a little bit more, especially if the outfield depth stays thin. And, it would, and if they make a move and send Dom off or, you know, McNeil, it becomes even thinner in the outfield position. Should we do our over-under? I think we should do our over-under. It's time. All right, you went first last time, so I'm going to take the reins Please this do. time. Okay, so you mentioned before the slugging percentage, and I think that is the make-or-break stat for whether or not Canna will upgrade his value, stay at the same value, or go below. I picked uh, the slugging mark for my over-under at 410 because it's right between where his slugging was last year compared to his overall single-season average in his career. So I have him falling right in the middle there. I think I am going to take the under in this regard. I think that he still could get above 400 and be serviceable there. It's just, you know, those extra ticks, I think it really comes down to whether or not he can play into the gaps of City Field and really find extra bases outside of the home run. Is this a terrible podcast that I am, like, swinging the other way from no. what I just said five minutes ago? That means because we've enhanced the discussion. That's you know? what we're doing. We're talking with each other. I, I looked a little bit deeper into uh, his baseball reference page, and I'm looking at these slugging numbers. In 18, he went 449. 19, which was his big power year, he had 26 homers. He had 517. And then in 2020, he had kind of a down year. He had 408, and then he went way down last year to 387. So the 410 mark, I feel like, is a little low. So I'm going to be optimistic here because I think there's so much room on that high end that I think even if he gets hot a little bit, uh, he'll blow that away. I changed my tune, and I'm going to take the over I here. I like that. I like that you changed mid-episode. It's kind of cool. Did we change each other there? Maybe, a little bit. I think right. you talked me down, and I talked you up a little bit. Look at this. Look at that. Group community activities. We're doing things. Yeah, I guess so. All right. What's your over-under? What do you got for me? Okay, so last year, you mentioned it early, uh, he was hit 27 times. Yeah. <laughs> that is an absurd amount. That is major league leading. Yeah. Uh, he is also known to get hit a lot, so in the shortened season – of 2020, he got hit 10 times. That is a lot. That's one every six games-ish. Look at that math. Wow. No, I mean, it's not a big deal. Math pod, it's not, not a big deal. You know, at 38, still still strong up here. Still uh, working. I wanted to have a fun one with him because uh, hit by pitches are fun only if it's not you. And we're talking about Mark Canna, so let's talk about him getting hit. Uh, so, like I said, in 2010, in the, in the game, we only played 59 games. He got hit 10 times. So yeah. that's already trending upward. And then last year, an astronomical 27. Yeah. So there's Freddie Freeman, who many Mets fans will know. Or I'm sorry, Anthony Rizzo. Anthony Rizzo, Who yeah. a lot of Mets fans will know gets hit all the time. He stands on top of the dish. So in the MLB, the last five years, it's Anthony Rizzo at the top. And then underneath him is Mark Canna. And then a bunch of gap below. And then it's everybody else. So these two, these are the two elite Hit by pitch guys. They've mastered their craft. So I wanted to go with, they had 18 in 2019 with 126 games. So I think it's going to go up. He's been trending mm. up. I think it might be a, uh, he moved closer to the dish. And so I wanted to set the over under at 13. Because 13. it's my lucky number. It's a beautiful number. Uh, I think we should do probably 13 and a half. Yep. That way, if I choose 13 or you choose 13, um, it's it's not a we're not falling push. right on it's it. It's not a push. Gotcha. So um, I'm gonna go first, okay. and I'm going to take the over. Okay. I think that it is not just a fluke. I think that he has done something philosophically at the plate, mechanically, to where he's staying in there. It's helped him, and I think he's just part of his approach now. Yeah. And I, I feel like you picked a good benchmark number here. I think if you said like 20, I probably would have taken the under. Just because I feel like 20, he'll never get to 27 again. I feel like pitchers have to bear it in mind now. You really only think about it when you think of a guy like Anthony Rizzo, but Canna is now in that class to where you won't, you just won't work him inside as much. You can't really get him to brush back on the plate. It doesn't work. He got hit 27 times. So I think at 13.5, I would take the over. I think he easily gets 15 right. again. Maybe not the 27 that led MLB, but it's definitely going to factor into his OBP being as high as it usually is. I don't want to get hit one time, let alone, yeah, we're, we're like, yay, 14, 15, we'll get you. And, he, like, how many of those are he's, fastballs? He's you know? Well, I mean, they're all fast, yeah, trust me. Yeah, they all hurt. I fouled a curveball in Milwaukee off my leg, and I almost retired on the spot. It hit me in the shin, and how old I, were you? I was in the big leagues in yeah, Milwaukee. Yeah. Yeah, and Jeez. it hit me, and I was... 
you guys do this all the time and they don't they don't you see I don't, them, personally. you see a guy foul a ball off and they just kind of like stand there and try to like wait it out cuz he got to look tough I I, I tried to call the cart to come get me I was like dude I'm not doing this <laughs> carry me out and I looked at the pitcher actually Eric Kratz was catching too I was oh, like nice. Kratz why are you throwing me a curveball like did you see the swing I took what was the count? You, I deserved a home run after you letting me foul that off. So yeah, you should true. be ashamed of yourself. Hey, did you put a good cut on it though? I mean, you made contact, right? I fouled it off my leg. It's pretty good. I struck out the. It was it was a ball off. Wow. Uh, fact. We checked it. Uh, he rung me up even after oh. I, I was so upset. That's but messed up. That's fine. They didn't give you a fair deal. They injured you and then they called you out. On this the ball. isn't a. This isn't a blev PPP though. This is we're talking about Mark Cannon. Listen, I like hearing about your hitting stories. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> One for four in his career. That's not bad, guys. That's a 250 average. It's pretty good. I'm in. Show. Show hit. That's a big deal. Yeah, anything else? No. All right. Guys, thanks for listening to our latest PPP. I think we've covered all the outfielders now, so we got to really diversify the I think palette. we only have three former uh, Oakland Athletics to go. Yeah, we're like <laughs> seven more. So thank you guys for tuning in to another PPP, and let's go Mets. Let's go Mets, baby. See you guys soon. Thanks for tuning in.